this Mother's Day. And I trust that you will have a good Mother's Day. And you can't take your mothers out to eat, at least here in Ohio, to a restaurant. I guess you could go and get curbside pickup, but somehow I don't think that will be quite the same. But I trust that you'll make a good day of it anyway. So happy Mother's Day to all, all the mothers. Now next Sunday we will begin our phased uh, reopening plan after the uh, virus issue. We'll begin with uh, just having worship like we've been doing, uh, starting at 10.30 on Sunday morning. We will, of course, also be continuing to be doing the live streaming of the worship. We hope to be able to keep doing that from now on. Um, but those who would like to be here next Sunday, you can do that. And we sent out the letter with the different recommendations. So we'll be asking to do the social distancing, trying to keep the six foot between you and others that are not part of your household. That's kind of hard for us to do, but I encourage you to try to do that. We'll have masks available for those who uh, are not uh, adversely affected by wearing them. And other things will be, we'll have hand sanitizer available for you. But just encourage you to make your own decisions on whether you will uh, venture out to do that. But it just seems like it's time uh, for us to gather again to worship. And we'll, we'll, we'll go forward with that. I would like now to read Psalm 93. And Psalm 93 talks about the majesty and the authority of the Lord. We'll consider that a little bit more as we get to our scripture text in Matthew a little bit later. Psalm 93, the Lord reigns, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their pounding waves, more than the sounds of many waters, than the mighty breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your testimonies are fully confirmed. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Let's pray. O Lord, as we gather together here uh, in this place set aside to worship you, and Lord, I know that uh, many are looking forward to the time when they can return after being isolated for this virus issue. But we are just reminded, Lord, as we read from your word, that you are robed in majesty, the Lord Almighty, and we worship you. And so I pray you continue to speak to each one of us things that we need to hear. Give us clarity. Lord, I, I pray for those who are struggling with various issues, health issues, financial issues relationship, just fears, um, uncertainties, just remind each one, Lord, um, who you are and who they are in you. And Lord, I pray that as we worship this morning, as we look into your word, that you would just open it up to us. And Lord, that it would change something in the way that we think. And somehow, Lord, it would draw us closer unto you. And it would cause us, Lord, to desire to, to walk with you, to serve you, and to honor you in all things. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. short series on the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus as we consider his preparation of the disciples for their mission. They are being prepared for a world-changing mission that was going to begin at Pentecost. The church, of course, would carry forward that message uh, from then on until the time the Lord returns at the end of the age. Now, although the church has been about this, obviously, for quite a while with varying degrees of fidelity, I think we can look over the course of history and we can see there's been different key moments and, and opportunities uh, for different things to happen that can be identified in the history of the church. And I believe possibly at one of those times now with this pandemic which has affected such a broad swath of the church, this, I believe that uh, certainly it's such a time for our own local church that God is preparing us for our own world-changing mission for what's coming next. A couple weeks ago, I made the case that the period between the resurrection and the ascension was what we call a Galilean retreat, when Jesus had multiple post-resurrection appearances with the Lord as he prepared them. The last couple weeks, we looked at the uh, scene at the Sea of Galilee when they had the miraculous catch of fish, and then the Lord 
talking to Peter. This morning we're going to look at the only recorded post-resurrection appearance of Jesus with his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew. Now whether this come before the Sea of Galilee event or after, uh, we don't know. But I think it's reasonable to see it as coming after the Sea of Galilee event, before the disciples were going to head back to Jerusalem, before the ascension of Jesus. So you want to take your Bibles and, and look to Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to look at verses 16 to 20. Again, Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." Figuratively speaking, I believe we can see here that it's important to spend time on the mountain with Jesus. Actually, the Lord directs us to spend time with him. We can see it in different scripture passages. In verse 16, we read that the 11 disciples had been directed by the Lord to go to the mountain. Exactly when he told them this, exactly which mountain it was, we don't know, but it's clear the Lord directed them to be there. I think actually there's kind of a, if we think about it, sort of a tragic sad note in verse 16 it says that there were 11 disciples and we know the Lord had 12 disciples in fact in different places in the scripture they're simply referred to as the 12 the missing person of course is Judas the one who betrayed Jesus to the religious authorities later filled with guilt and remorse he took his own life and we don't have any recorded information that any of the other of the 11 uh, turned away from their calling. But unfortunately, the same can't be said for all the Lord's disciples down through the ages. There have been those, many who have turned away. Some of those who have turned away from their calling have returned, but they still had some measure of regret for the time that they had walked away from their call. How much better it is to spend time on the mountain, to spend time with Jesus, than to, to turn away, to go our own way because of apathy or because of fear. I want to encourage you not to be the missing man or the missing woman. Because the Lord has a call, if you're a believer, the Lord has a call on your life. So spend time on the mountain with Him. Let's consider a couple of things that will happen on the mountain. First, there will be worship. Uh, verse 17 is a very important verse. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some were doubtful. The fact that they worshiped Jesus tells that these men saw him as God. You don't worship someone who is not God. These men saw him as God. Now these Jewish men would have been taught the Shema from the time they were very little boys. The Shema is different Hebrew scriptures brought together in the form of prayer that the Jewish people would say in the morning and in the evening. And they would recite if possible before death. Someone might recite it for them. We read just the first lines. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. They've been taught from very early age about the monotheistic God. There's one God. And to worship him. They've also been taught that if you were in the present, you gazed upon the Lord, you wouldn't be able to survive. But yet here they are, these Jewish men, on the mountain, in the presence of Jesus, worshiping him as God. Now, if you'll think about the tremendous sea change this is in their understanding of God, represented by this verse, I think it will help you to understand the second part of the verse, where it says that some were doubtful. One question we might ask here is, who's, who is doubting? Some suggest that there were many people on that mountain. We know there's a rather large group of disciples that followed Jesus. We get over to Acts, we'll see those gathered together. You know, the women may have been there as well. Now, who was it that doubted? That might relieve us if we said we thought it wasn't the disciples. Particularly when we think about that appearance we looked at a few weeks ago when Thomas was in the room and Jesus was there. Remember Thomas' great confession, my Lord and my God. But I think Matthew here is focused on the 11. 
that somehow some of the eleven doubted. The Greek construction of sentences, sentences such that it, it is true that all eleven worshipped God, but some were doubtful. We understand this, this word is translated as doubtful, can also be translated as hesitant, um, undecided between two ways. You're, you're trying to figure out which way to go. It has, the word has kind of like, it means double, like there's two things. You're trying to decide, you can't decide. And so I think what this verse is telling us is everybody comes to a fullness of the faith at different ways, at different levels. So for us, if there's places where we're struggling in our faith, some, we shouldn't all expect to be at the same place at the same time. So we shouldn't beat ourselves up and we shouldn't hold things against others. But trust that we continue to spend time on the mountain with the Lord, He will increase our faith. I encourage you to continue your own time on the mountain. Another thing we see from our text is that we will, uh, we will receive. One thing we'll receive is a greater understanding of who the Lord is. In verse 18, uh, the disciples uh, worshipped Jesus, and he came close to them. Uh, we read verse 18, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. To me, there's some a little bit of mystery here. Who gave him the authority? When was it given? Is it a shared authority? Is the authority that he's speaking about here different than the authority he had earlier in the gospel when we read that he, the people said he taught as one with authority? Well, we can be sure that it's the Father who has given him the authority it would seem to be authority that was given to him eternally, much like the Son is eternally begotten from the Father. It seems to be a shared authority with order within the Godhead. We looked in 1 Corinthians 15, there's the end of the passage there, talks about things, all things being subjected to Christ, but the one who gave the authority is not subjected to him. We may look at that at some time later. There, there seems to be some differentiation, at least in the exercise of his authority, between the time when he, in humility, took on human flesh and, and walked and ministered and to the, after he had victory over the principalities and powers and over the curse of sin and death upon the cross, as we see in Colossians 2. It also seems apparent there could be some connection here between the authority the Lord has, he's speaking of here, and the loss uh, for Satan of whatever temporary authority he'd been given on earth. One way to interpret this is that it could be the binding of Satan we read about in Revelation from the time he is released to deceive the nations and bring about the war that ends with the day of judgment. On the other hand, it's clear that Satan is not without some ability now to deceive and influence for evil. But equally clear to us is that we need not fear whatever limited influence Satan has because we are followers of the risen Christ and we will receive power through him that we need for whatever we face. The passage makes this clear to us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. And it's been talked about God the Father, and we read into to verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accord with the working of the strength of his might, which he has brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Continuing on in verse 22 and 3. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so we see here this authority from God the Father being given to the Son. He's Christ his head over the church, and his power comes upon us. So we can see then figuratively speaking that when we come to the mountain and worship the Lord, the eyes of our heart will be enlightened. And we will know more of the Lord's surpassing greatness of his power towards us. The other things we'll receive when we come to the mountain, there's many things, we don't have time this morning to look at all of them, but one certainly is that we will receive our mission. 
I like to think under this heading, engaging your part of the mission. Let's think for a bit about the command to the eleven. This is what we often refer to as the Great Commission. Some people call it the marching orders of the church. We find in verses 19 and 20. There, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, this was given to the eleven. They would be the ones who had the primary responsibility initially to proclaiming it. But as we look in the book of the Acts, we see very quickly others were raised up to also carry this mission forward. As we read through Acts, we read in the letters of the New Testament, we'll see that every follower of Christ is given this commission to go into the world, to make disciples. So if you're a follower of Jesus, these verses are applying to you. So let's think about the overarching mission to make disciples given to the eleven and then to the many. The first is simply to proclaim the gospel, to, to tell the truth. We know from Romans that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. Now, it's important for us to remember we don't persuade somebody into the kingdom. We don't argue somebody into the kingdom. It is through a gift of faith by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that someone is born again. So this is a relief to us that we don't have to persuade, argue someone. The Lord does this work. But we do have the responsibility to proclaim the truth. We must proclaim the good news. We must we proclaim the good news when we worship together. And we have the responsibility to proclaim the good news as individuals, as we're sent out by the Lord within our own sphere of influence, wherever it is that we go. And when a person is born again, then we are to baptize them. In verse 19, we see possibly the clearest Trinitarian reference we find in the Scriptures. Jesus said that we are to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's important to note that it doesn't say in the names, but in the name, singular. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So here we see clearly the three in one. We're going to think more about the Trinity when we return back to our series through the Confession of Faith. But for now, keep this verse in mind. Because you're going to have people tell you, I don't see the word Trinity in the Scripture. But if you read the Scriptures and you look, you'll see all through it. The, the Trinitarian flow of the scriptures and this is just one example the baptism is symbolic representation of a person being brought into the family of God through baptism a person is welcomed into the body of Christ it should trouble us a great deal when we um, hear statistics of some big revival event and how many people were converted or somebody talked about I went out and I led this many people to the Lord and so forth if these people are not connected to a local church, if they're not having any desire to grow in Christ, we shouldn't be claiming that they are conversions. They're truly born again. Because if you are truly born again, you have a hunger and a desire to know Christ more. You have a desire to be among His people, to be worshiping, to be growing. You see, conversion is just the beginning of the process of making disciples. Once we are born again, we are to become more like Christ the rest of our lives. And this simply doesn't happen outside the fellowship of believers. All of us have probably known someone who is, is claiming to be a, a believer, and we don't want to doubt that they are, but they said they don't, they're not part of a church, and they find fault with everything of every church. They have all these ideas why everything is wrong. And what I suggest to you there is someone who is immature in their faith, not mature in their faith. Because the Lord calls us to gather together and to, to disciple one another. And we see the major portion of making disciples comes in the, in the uh, first part, uh, the last part of the commandment, the first part of verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So it's not just a person to come to the point of realizing that they're lost and accepting Christ as their Savior and Lord, but then growing from there, that's the major part of making disciples of the Great Commission. You'll notice it's not simply the idea of imparting knowledge. Certainly, helping people to understand the Scriptures is an important part of this, but it's transformation. It's a changed life. It's evidenced by actually living in accordance with the Lord's Word. 
Some of your translations might use the word uh, keep or obey instead of observe. I guess it's the same idea that we're not simply to be hearers of the word, to be doers of the word, and more fully not simply doing the word out of some legalistic kind of idea, but because we're becoming more and more like Christ and we're desiring to follow him, we have a love for the Lord, and so we're being changed and transformed. They may ask some question exactly what Jesus meant when he said, uh, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. What did Jesus command? What is, what is included in the all? Now, certainly there are some things that we're not going to be teaching to do. We're not going to be offering animal sacrifices. We're not having to observe the food regulations. Yet Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount tells us not to neglect the law of the prophets. He said, not the, not the smallest letter or stroke will, will fade away until all is fulfilled. But also in that passage, Jesus talks about himself being the fulfillment. So there's some struggle for us to try to understand exactly what is involved. We're going to think some more about this when we get into our confession of faith in the article that talks about the harmony of the law and the gospel. But till then, maybe this uh, quote from R.T. France in his gospel, his uh, commentary on the Gospel of Matthew would be helpful. He says, disciples should delight in and learn from every word that God has written rather than picking and choosing between them. And I think that's good advice. Well, making disciples involves our teaching, but we need to understand that teaching is more than telling. We also teach by living out the words ourselves. We model it by our lives. We mentor people by our lives. This is another reason for it's important for us to be in fellowship with one another. You know, it's in the realities of living out our life. It's, it may be easy for me to say, this is how we should live, this is what we should do, but when life really is affecting me, that's when I'm actually living out what I'm teaching. And that's where I'm able to help you with what I've struggled with. And likewise, you can help me as you learn and go through and struggle with life. It's in the reality of life that we're applying it, so we have to live out our faith in front of people and among people. You know, it's, it's a, really, we oftentimes complain about technology and so forth, advances, but there's a lot of good things that are happening. Even right now, so many people across the country and other parts of the world are able to watch their own uh, worship online and do these things. And, and then, you know, beyond that, you have access to, to listen to great preachers and teachers of the Scripture. You can look up things, written resources that you can read. It's great to have these things. But a person who, who depends solely on these things that you get off of the computer or off of the, off of the internet or what you read in a book and not within a fellowship of believers is going to be stunted and immature in your faith. We need each other. We need to be in fellowship. Or we need to be mentoring those who God brings into our world. Which leads to the next thing we need to think about and that is that you have a mission to change your world. Let's listen again to the first part of the commandment that the Lord gave to the disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now the Lord is speaking here, this getting ready to begin the church. He's going to begin with these 11 men. He's going to go to all nations. And these men are uh, representing the church collectively going to all the nations. But during the earthly ministry of Jesus, if you remember, they were directed just to go to the Jewish people. Let's look at one passage that shows that. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 to 6. Matthew 10, verses 5 to 6. These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were to go initially to God's chosen people who had been given the word and given the law. And they were the ones who were to take the message of God's redeeming message to the world. And they were to go to them first. But different places in the scripture, including the Gospel of Matthew, and other places, beginning with the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, we know that there was going to be a mission to all nations, to all people. Before it was just the Jewish people, but here in Matthew 28, clearly it's being made manifest. Now it's going into the whole world. Now we should be careful to note here, this doesn't mean they're no longer to reach the Jewish people. 
Instead, the mission has been expanded to include all of us. There's not one plan of salvation for the Jewish people, another plan for the non-Jewish people. There's one gospel, and there's one mission. As a collective whole, the church has a responsibility of making disciples of all nations over the whole globe. Yet obviously, no one church or even any one large mission agency can go into every nation and every place. But every church has its sphere of influence. And as we studied at some length before, each individual believer has your own sphere of influence, your world, your oikos, we were referring to it. The word oikos is simply the Greek word meaning household, which we have defined as those people who are on the front burner of your life. Maybe family members, close friends and associates, people who are within your sphere of influence. One of the things that I've been thinking about some in the midst of this stay-at-home order because of the virus issue is how particularly important this responsibility is for those closest to us. So maybe your children, could be your brothers and sisters, your spouse, your parents, your grandchildren, those who are closest to you, that you have a particular responsibility of proclaiming the gospel, of making disciples. You know, over the years, I think we have kind of gravitated the idea that we send our children off to school for what they need from a secular perspective, you know, to be educated, to get a job, to do well in life, that kind of thing. And then we we send them off to, to church or to Sunday school to hear things, youth group, midweek programs, to learn the things they need for the faith. Well, there certainly should be benefit in these things. We need to, we need to do these things. But it's to happen preeminently in the home. Mothers and fathers, it is your responsibility for all of the learning and teaching of your children, not just the secular part, the faith part, but all of it. It began preeminently in the home. You know, today being Mother's Day, we may think about all the important things that mothers do, but there can be no important thing that a mother does than to do all she can do to make disciples of her children. Fathers, of course, share in this vital work as well, but with it being Mother's Day, let me share a brief story from history uh, that makes this point. What I'm going to read is written by a guy by the name of Schuyler Kopex. At least how you pronounce his name. He was the Speaker of the House in Congress uh, during the American Civil War and the period right after the war. You know how tumultuous a time that was after the assassination of President Lincoln. And he was also the Vice President under Ulysses S. Grant. I'll just read what he wrote. Man derives his greatest happiness not by that which he does for himself, but by what he accomplishes for others. This is a sad world at best, a world of sorrow, of suffering, of injustice, of falsification. Men stab those who they hate with the stiletto of slander. But it's for the followers of our Lord to improve it and to make it more as Christ would have it. The most precious crown of fame that a human being can ask is to kneel at the bar of God and hear the beautiful words, well done, good and faithful servant. Just 50 years ago this fall, in a large city by the seashore, nearly a thousand miles from here, a lady whose husband was dead, took her little boy by the hand and led him to the Sabbath school. For 30 years afterwards, he was a scholar or a teacher of the Sabbath school, and he has never forgotten those instructions of you. The lady who took her little boy to that Sunday school is now in a happier land, but the boy is still living. That lady was my beloved mother, who is with her father and savior in heaven, and that little boy was myself. Today I come to this school with my little boy and his mother with us, that we may place his imperfect steps in the path in which my mother placed my little feet half a century ago. That story could be repeated a thousand times over. I know I'm thankful for my own mother. I'm thankful for my grandmothers and their influence upon my parents, their influence upon me. I'm thankful for my mother-in-law and her faithfulness, her desire to make disciples of her children. I'm thankful for the faithfulness of my wife, the mother of our children. 
and her faithfulness, this great duty of making disciples of her children and grandchildren. What a beautiful and awesome responsibility it is we have to make disciples of those closest to us. To share what we have learned in life, to at times share our own struggles, our own failures, but to know that as we place our hope in Christ, to know that we have redemption, that we have fullness of life, that we have purpose and meaning. And we can get busy with so many things. And we can go through life day by day, week by week, and be absent from this great mission that the Lord has given us, be making disciples. And I'm particularly thinking now the importance of making disciples of those closest to us. Wherever any of us have neglected in that duty, let us repent of the neglect, but then take up from wherever we're at and doing what the Lord calls us to do and trusting that He will work through it and that He will help us in this great work. So let us make disciples of those closest to us. But by all means, don't stop there. Consider the other precious souls that are within your personal world. You know, there's people who are not going to enter this building or any other church building on their own. But the Lord is sending his great army out with the truth of his word to share your story. The Lord has not called us personally to go into every country of the world. But he has certainly called us to get off the couch. Right? to get beyond our comfort zone and to go to the people he's put into our world. You know, as we think about coming out of this odd stay-home order time, this has been an odd time for a lot of different ways and things. But as we think about coming out of this time, I urge you to spend time on the mountain with the Lord. Worship him. And you will receive from him. Hear what he says to you. I urge you to spend some time just meditating upon these verses. We've heard these verses many times before. But let them speak to you. I urge you to ask the Lord, Lord, how does this apply to me? If you're truly a follower of Jesus, I can tell you one thing the Lord will not tell you as you ask that question. He won't tell you that doesn't apply to you. Don't worry about it. You know, that's the preacher's job. That's the deacon's job. You know, that's the evangelism team's job. That's somebody else the church's job. If you're a follower of Christ, you're going to hear something from the Lord when you ask, what does this mean to me? If you're not a follower of Jesus, what you might hear is repent and come to me. Come to me. And to know the beauty of his forgiveness and renewal of being made a new creation. Now, assuming you recognize the need to increase your obedience in regard to your part of the mission, you may some, feel some anxiety or inadequacy. How am I going to be able to do what he's calling me to do? Remember the Lord's presence with you. Think about those 11 men, the disciples who stood on that mountain and with the Lord. And they have been given an incomprehensibly big mission. Go to all nations. They were just, the trip we told, they were just a ragtag little band of brothers, fishermen, tax collectors, and so forth. We couldn't blame them if they thought something like, how can we do that? Look at us. Well, if they thought something like that, they would have been right. There's no way they could do what they were being sent to do. There's no way they could do what they ended up doing. Which is why the Lord added this beautiful and powerful benediction. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Was the Lord faithful to these men? Absolutely. The Lord worked through these men and others that followed him to turn the world upside down. I believe it was Acts chapter 17 when the Disciples come to Thessalonica and they said, here come these men who have been turning the world upside down. The Lord still turns the world upside down as believers go in his power and his authority. I 
maybe didn't spend enough time talking about the authority you have. You're, it's not from you, it's authority in Christ. He's been given all authority. You'll come up against all sorts of opposition, all sorts of things that seem like it has power, but that is not the true power. All authority, all power has been given in Christ, and He sends you. You know, if you took away the Christian influence in the world today, it would be a very dark world indeed. When you look at places in the world where the darkest, it's where the light of Christ is most absent. But as the light of Christ, as believers begin to multiply and to share, then we begin to see the change. Let it not be that darkness prevails in your personal world. But that's the only part that you have responsibility for. But let darkness not prevail, but instead let it be light. See, you have a big mission. You can't accomplish your mission on your own. I mean, I can think of different folks I would love to see to come to know the Lord and follow the Lord and have the joy, but I can't persuade or argue them. The Lord has to do it, but I don't go alone. The Lord goes with me. And the same with you, he's promised you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Your encouragement comes from the Lord. Your authority and power comes from the Lord. And go, therefore, and make disciples. Let's pray. Well, Lord, let us not um, somehow deflect what this passage is speaking to us individually. Lord, help us to linger over these verses. Lord, help us to ask the questions, what would you have me to do? Lord, remind us that you have placed us where we are by your will. Remind us, Lord, that, that we have people that you have sent us to. Remind us, Lord, the joy that comes as we are faithful in making disciples. Oh Lord, may it be that more and more light prevails and not darkness. Lord, let us do this not with any kind of arrogance or certainty or pride, but by a simple trust in you, you who are with us. So continue to speak to us, Lord. Speak to us as we, as we worship here, as we sing. Lord, speak to us as we continue to linger over your words, for we pray and ask in your name. So it could be that your child or grandchild is off somewhere else and you're praying for them and someone else is used to make a disciple of them. I'd like to encourage you to think about that God is going to use you to make a disciple of somebody else's child or grandchild. There's a mission for each of us. And 
is a different direction this message could have gone in, but this great making disciples of all nations, how can we do that? Well, the Lord has raised up his army. It's up to us to be faithful in answering that call. And the Lord will work through us. As we close this morning, I want to read this as a word of benediction, the words that was in our scripture reading uh, from Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verses 20 through 21. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead and the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we can just read from your word and that you do give us the strength and the power and the authority. So Lord, may we go forth in your name beautiful name of Jesus and the power of the Father and the Holy Spirit. And these things we pray and ask in your name.